Welcome to Positive Filter with your host, Philip Wilkerson, a podcast that focuses on friends, family, health, and career with a little self-help along the way. Please join me in this journey for self-improvement, and I hope what I have to share will make you a better person, thus making the world a better place. I hope you enjoy the show. Hello, people of the world. It's Philip Wilkerson back with another episode of Positive Filter. I'm joined by a special guest. Everyone's a special guest. I'm joined, I must say, just unofficially, my uh, PhD mentor, Kevin. Now, um, I'm in my PhD journey. Uh, I don't know how long. Maybe I won't finish. Maybe I will. But at least for, during this journey, I've met some amazing people. And one of the amazing people I met, fortunately, in my first class was Kevin. Um, and, you know, I'm getting my PhD in communication, and Kevin was the outsider in our first class. He was uh, on one, he was on the, this is my first class, this is like one of his last classes, classes, yep. Yeah. And he was not in the comm program, he was in the public health program, but, you know, the stars were aligned, um, and, you know, he joined us, and he's really been helpful to not only me, but also a lot of other PhD students uh, within the comm program, uh, public health program and just in general. So Kevin, um, go ahead and give the listeners uh, who you are. And also I purposely did not say your last name because I didn't want to butcher it on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, my name is Kevin Savasco. I am a uh, PhD uh, in public health epidemiology student in the College of Public Health at George Mason. And uh, I met you in classes in communication, but you know, I think you've seen already, there's a lot of people who are interested in communication around health since that's such a big thing. I mean, in the U S it's about 20% of the economy is, is spent on health. So, you know, using communications to try to educate people and improve our health is huge. I, I think it's probably, hopefully it's not the last uh, public health person you run into nursing or one of the other social work programs. I, I hope you continue to run into them. Excellent. Well, Kevin, you know, one of the things is you want to learn your journey is that you had a world of work. You have a life experience before you decided to come back. So, you know, you know, dialing it back, you know, tell us a little bit about your career, mm -hmm. you know, and how you got to this space and then, you know, go from there about getting into the Ph.D. program. Yeah. And you mentioned me, me being your Ph.D. mentor, but I think part of it is just I'm, I'm in my 50s and, and, and back for my Ph.D. <laughs> so having been an employee and a manager and a consultant, et cetera, for for decades bringing that experience and you know i love the energy you get from you know having people's in 20s and 30s and even 40s in class with you so it's it's kind of great so anything i can do to kind of mentor the the next generations is good um because being a phd student is interesting because if you come from being a student you know it's a student and then there's a professor and you know it's like enlisted and uh, officer you know it's two different worlds but once you become a phd student you're probably a graduate research assistant or a graduate teaching assistant um, or taking on your own research. And, you know, you have to switch to becoming more of an employee role or, or a junior researcher where you're working with somebody and you're on your way at some point to becoming an expert in an area. So it, it's a big difference than being a student. Um, so I spent a lot of time talking to my classmates about just how to manage that transition because they're being asked a lot and it's good. It's good experience for them. Um, so yeah, as far as how did I get, get here? here? Yeah. How'd you get here? <laughs> um, so now that I explained here what I'm doing here, um, I originally graduated from Mason in the late eighties with a computer science degree, um, and did it and went back and got a master's in business and did a lot of it outsourcing, which combines uh, it and business. And at some point, about 15 years ago, one of my colleagues said, hey, you want to join the board? And, and he asked me to join the board of this um, patient charity at the NIH. Um, so I showed up. I said, you know, you're, you, you have a fair bit of money, but it's all over the place, right? You have no strategy. He goes, yeah, now you know why I asked you here. Yeah. So you end up hanging around the NIH, and they do amazing work where they run clinical trials within the NIH, not just grant money. Um, so you start seeing all these patients with, you know, HIV, lupus, all these other sickle cell and the NIH is like front lines coming up with the uh, treatments that you then later see, you know, in the hospitals near you. And um, so I was just doing that on the side while I was doing IT consulting. But, you know, one day I'm in the middle of the work and I get an email from our 
CEO when I was the board chair, and it was from um, a family who needed to cover the rent back home for a couple of months while the social workers at the NIH got them squared away, and their older son was about to drop out of high school to get a job to pay the rent. And, you know, <laughs> in the middle of the workday, I had this tear rolling down my, down my cheek, and you don't get that a lot as an IT consultant, so mm-hmm. I think from an emotional perspective, that's what kind of started me down the road, and I started my master's of public health and finished that up during the pandemic. Dang, so you went back and uh, got a master's again. Yeah. And then get So while you were getting your master's in public health, you're like, dang, I'm back in school. What was that adjustment, right? So we got to talk about that adjustment. I didn't, I didn't oh, realize yeah. you got your master's first. So what yeah. was that? So, you know, the, the first degrees, you know, there really was no internet or it was just <laughs> beginning during my, my first graduate degree. So, you know, all these things like Blackboard and email and all these online searches for articles. I mean, there's so much stuff out there, so it's a completely different educational experience. There's some of it that's great in that you can look up just about anything you want, but then, you know, the bad part is you can look up just about anything you want, right. and you can go down rabbit holes and, and get lost. So I think the focus required now and the amount of just things that hit your brain are overwhelming. So the students today... Uh, I think the amount they know or know how to get to is is phenomenal, but it's just such a skill trying to figure out where to stop, you know, how to keep control of your of your work, focus on what's due, and not just get caught, you know, looking into everything, or just get overwhelmed and not do anything because you just feel overwhelmed because you think you should know everything. There's articles written on everything in journals and news, et cetera. It's just bombarded by information, so. It's, it's definitely a different student experience. So you were doing that during the pandemic, right? When you go back, when you go back for the master's? Uh, I went back for the master's, I think around 2017. So I was just, I was working full time mm-hmm. and then doing one class, two class. But um, when the pandemic hit, I was actually finishing up my MPH and I was interning at the National Association of uh, County and City Health Officials. So they're one of the big nonprofits that work you know, with the CDC and working with the local health department. So I was sitting on phone calls, taking notes, you know, even though I've been an an executive, you know, when you're an intern, you're an intern. (laughs) Yeah. So I sat on phone calls and took notes and shared and, you know, they were running a, um, a whole, um, sort of executive committee working and gathering information from the local health departments, you know, what was going well, what was not, what policy they needed. And, you know, just that learning experience was was amazing, and and without having gone back to school, and being working on a practicum and an internship, you never would have had that. So, those are the kinds of things that you know, I've heard people say, "Well, aren't you learning a lot from your job and from your life?" Yeah, but there's nothing like sitting as an intern <laughs> yeah. in a field what you had nothing to do with before, just absorbing that you realize how much there is out there. Did you ever feel like some like? You know, like not ageism, but also like it's half and half, right? Like the external world, you know, like looking at you differently because, like you said, I, I've been an executive and now I got to be an intern again. Yeah. And then on the inverse, you having to check your own ego and be like, mm-hmm. man, like these people don't know what they're doing, but in this space, I'm an intern, right? So, like, yeah. talk about that dynamic. Yeah. So, nature, and, and, and also in class too. I bet that shit yeah. up in class too. Yeah. So, it is because you have to both be bring your life experience, but you don't want to you know, sit and preach because there's a lot you don't know. And so trying to figure out when do you shut up? And if there's someone who's 25 years younger than you, but they've been doing this longer than you have, because it's a new area, you know, you sit there and then you talk through, okay, what are we supposed to do? Here's my thoughts on how I'm going to do it. Um, Look, look for advice from them. Make sure they're comfortable giving you advice that you're not like the old person that they're (laughs) afraid to tell what to do. So you've got to establish that rapport that, you know, you bring a lot, but you also know, uh, sometimes I joke like you're the Tyrannosaurus Rex, you know, giant, powerful beast, tiny little arms, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it depends what you're trying to do. Sometimes those tiny little arms are the problem and you have to go to, you know, the 25 year old or 30 year old and go, Hey, you know, tell me what we're trying to accomplish. You know, mm-hmm. what, what have you done before? What's worked well? What hasn't? This is what I'm thinking and listen and try to replicate the success. But then sometimes they'll run into other things in the workplace about, you know, partnerships or politics and they'll like come up and say, Hey, you know, what do you think about this? So, you know, you are multiple people. You're not just one person and you have to remember when you take the internship role and when you do the listening and when you are mentored and then, but also be available and 
be open enough that when they want advice from other perspectives, career, et cetera, they're okay coming to you. I mean, I felt like that. I mean, I'm, I'm just laughing and smiling because like <laughs> that was the tone. Like, you know, in our first class, you, you know, you show deference and humility to the professor, right? And obviously, I mean, he, <laughs> Professor Maybach is the goat, so it's hard he not is. to like, he's like he was getting like <laughs> national awards while he was teaching us. But yeah. you were able, like you set aside, like, it was almost like I could see that dynamic working where even Ed would call on you to talk and speak yeah. on behalf of the class, yeah. but you also deferred that he's the expert on this. Yeah. But then unofficially, like you said, students such as myself and others would just gravitate to you, yeah. not per se about the subject matter, but yeah. more so like, how would you do this? Or, you know, yeah. like more like that side experience. Yeah. So it's like you were like having to put in your mind, you were a student yeah. But then unofficially, you were like the unofficial TA. <laughs> like, yeah. I don't know how that happened, right? And so did that dynamic show up a lot in other classes too? Um, yeah, but I can't say that I'm the one that who invented that. So when I did my business master's, I was in my early mid-20s, kind of like a mm -hmm. lot of the class. And we had, um, I, was, I was where I was working, one of the seniors, exec, wanted people to go back to school. And he said, well, if I want them to go back to school, I should go back to school. Mm -hmm. So I happened to be in the MBA program with like a deputy chief information officer and I remember watching him during class. So we were like in some management accounting class and in business school, there's a lot of case studies. So there's a lot of, okay, we read, here's the scenario with the company and managers, blah, blah, blah. Well, the discussion was going around the room being led by the professor, but George, who was the senior deputy CIO, wasn't saying anything. And then towards the end of the conversation, there was some debate back and forth. Um, he would, the professor went over to George and said, what do you think, George? He'd go, fricking bean counters. So he jumped in with opinion on this particular consulting, you know, accounting perspective, and he called them bean counters. So it was his experience where a bean counter being someone who's just counting stuff, they have no idea what the pur purpose of anything is. Mm -hmm. So he framed the case study from his life, but he let the conversation go on because it wasn't his, he didn't, I mean, the point of place. him jumping in right up front and saying, this is my opinion, and everyone would be quiet, but he let the younger students talk and negotiate, but then the professor went to him for sort of like a, here's what the real deal is, right? These people aren't really adding value to the organization. They're just calculating numbers. So we should take that into account. And it sort of like closed that part of the conversation and we moved on. So I always <laughs> keep George in mind when I'm sitting in class. I went, there's a lot of times when George didn't talk <laughs> okay. and let the conversation go and let them learn. But if the professor knows there's someone in the room with some experience that could help, he'll call on you when it's time. So I tried to I try to mirror George. That's a good idea. Yeah. I'm going to try to model that too. It's hard for me. You know, I like to talk. Oh, yeah. So I'm going to try to, on the inverse, let others talk until yeah. I feel like I have some. What was it saying? Like, think about the, the way, like, when you're talking, do I need to be said? Does it need to be me? Like, there's some questions you need to ask yourself. Yeah. Like, does it need to be me? Does it need, does it need to be said right now? Yeah. Does it add value? Exactly. And then, like, sometimes I'm like, mm, maybe not. Yeah. Like, I just want to talk to talk. And is it about you or, or is about it about me. the topic? Yeah, right? so that's might... the other thing. It's easy to chime in and say, you know, yeah. my experience from 30 years ago is blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Instead, right, how can you add to the conversation, keep it focused in the room and the people, and not just frame it in terms of something that happened to you, but bring that experience in a way that is present in the room, that you don't have to have the, you know, the inside story in your own head. To, to make it valuable. I love that. So one of the things is that you're going through this program and you could have just stopped and get a master's in MPH. When did mm -hmm. it start to click over? It's like, y'all need to keep going. Yeah. Well, part of it, I was doing IT consulting and sales for 30 some years and having that emotional experience and working with the, uh, with the NIH charity, you know, like, okay, it was just, it was time for a change. Um, fortunate enough to that, that my wife's career has really taken off as well. So it was an opportunity family-wise for her to focus on her work and me to, to make a change. So the, when I was doing the masters, um, uh, one of, one of my mentors, um, Dr. Von Fricken, when the pandemic hit and they were canceling, he does a lot of overseas work and they were canceling travel to, to Kenya, et cetera. Um, he said, Hey, do you want to do a study instead? So that was my introduction to research because a professor came to me and said, Hey, you want to, you want to participate and we can do a study. So we collected all kinds of data about how universities reacted to all the policies for lockdown oh, yeah. and I, shutdown. I remember that. It wasn't that I didn't come up with that. He class. did. I brought my business experience into the data collection and, but 
I got through that by his mentorship and then my current advisor, Dr. Rowe, is her mentorship, like teaching me how to do research. So this was at, in, in the MPH program, wasn't even the PhD. Mm -hmm. But during that, they said, hey, you know, we are starting a PhD public health program. I am in first cohort. Oh, okay. So they were encouraging me to apply. So, you know, it's just things just sort of dominoed into it, you know, Usually, yeah, less appeal to the current career, you know, good time to make a change, pandemic hit. Um, so I decided, yeah, just try to, try to get the degree and, you know, something I can use for as long as I want to work. So, you know, obviously a PhD, I always say it's like not a individual degree. It's a family degree. So what was that? <laughs> I haven't heard that, I mean, but it's so you know, true. like, you yeah. know, cause you're going to have to do studying and stuff. You got to have other people on board, particularly yeah. your wife on yeah. board. So what was that discussion like when you were like, Hey, I might be doing this. Well, you know, was your wife like, go for it. Like, let's have some work. She had some <laughs> reservations. Like, this this is a family thing, right? Like, yeah. She you know. says, where are you going with this? Says, I don't know. Yeah. But, you yeah. know, it's something I really wanted to do. So she said, okay. Um, okay, that's so. an easy conversation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, like, I, mean, I, I, I abbreviated a little bit, but I, I, I mean, you have to be supportive. Otherwise, it's just not going to work. So, um, yes, yeah, she was great. So, I mean, the good thing is being around the house, she continued to work even during the pandemic out of the house. So, you know, take over, you know, a lot of the uh, more of the house stuff than I was doing while you're going to school, you know, a lot more flexibility, although there's still tons of hours in a PhD, you know, being in class and doing research, there's a lot more flexibility in when you can do things and what you can do with the family. So, yeah. So yeah. what was some strategies you had to put in place? Cause obviously it's a, now it's a core component of your life, right? You're a father, yeah. I think you're a grandfather, right? <laughs> I am. Yeah, a grandfather, father, husband. Yeah. I mean, you got many hats. So how did you allocate time and space to this? Yeah, so I think the, the hardest part is when I first started, I resigned from my job and they asked me to stick around. So kind of winding down the job while doing the school. Um, so that was part of the, the compromise family as well. You know, make sure I ease out of things. But that first semester was a lot of weekends um, as well during the week. So that was not fun, but then the summer hit. So a lot more flexibility. Um, so that was a lot better, um, with some mentoring with some younger students on campus. So a lot of it is just balancing, like when, when is your time and when is school time? Because it can, you know, bleed 24 seven around the clock. So, you know, it isn't necessarily just a nine to five job. There's some creativity. So sometimes a, a thought hits you and you want to work it, but you gotta, you gotta know when, when to stop, set your boundaries. And so for me, like mon Monday morning, I'll run out to the coffee shop. I was just, there's just an article in Harvard business review. I went over today as well that like, you've got to sort of manage your schedule. Um, and yeah, and for me it's Monday, I'll go to campus or go to the coffee shop. Even mm -hmm. if I work from home most of the week, except for school, I, I do things like that. And then, you know, we, my, my son and other folks in the house, we divide up like dinner. So we have the family dinner. So you want to wind down your work so that you're present at dinner and we all eat as a group and talk about our day. Um, if I'm real busy, I'll pop on at night, but I'm much more of a morning person. So I'm typically get up, get a bunch of work done so that by the time it's dinner time, we're fine. Um, but you got, you got to know when to shut down. Um, Otherwise, yeah, you can just keep going around the clock and that's not, that's, that's not healthy. It seems very business minded. So how much of that like business and life experience informed you and made you a, 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 a say successful PhD student? Yeah. So that's interesting at work. You know, my father taught me work wise to, you know, well, what are you really trying to accomplish? What are the organization's goals? Cause you can have the same problem there where there's always a million people asking you to help. And you can get wrapped up in absolutely everything. And next thing you know, you're working 12, 16 hours a day, um, which isn't sustainable year after year. So trying to figure out when something important, when you up your time, when you put extra effort in, but when those crunch times end, pull back, say no, um, go home for dinner. Um, if a lot of it is saying no and prioritizing. Um, but when you are on something, do it really well. Um, and do it successfully so that you do have the reputation. But, you know, if your only value to the organization is that you have unlimited time and you just give everything, um, I think that's not fair to you and your family or even work because you're, you should be, especially as you become more senior, you should be helping people at work prioritize what's important and saying no um, and putting one thing or the other. Sheesh, I need that life. You know me. I need that yeah. life advice right yeah. now. This is big life advice. Yeah. So, like, um... You know, let's talk about, I mean, mentorship is very important. You said mentor, mentor, mentor mm -hmm. yeah. about you. 
Uh, what does it mean to be a mentor? I think that, as I said, I called you one unofficially. I think that's probably the first time I said it on a mic yeah. or out loud. I probably yeah. the first time, but you know, you know, me and many other students gravitated to you and asked you questions. And yeah. so, what does mentorship mean to you? Um, great question. So, one of my first business classes, uh, we actually had a. I went to Virginia Tech, but we actually had a retired uh. Harvard. <laughs> We had a, a retired Harvard professor come through, and he not only taught the class well, he knew the people in the case studies, who they were. He helped write them, so his vision was amazing. But even though we have this case study of you know eight employees and this business problem, whatever, the first thing he would do is go up to the go up to the whiteboard and go, "Okay, tell me about Mr. Smith." I'm like, what? Aren't we going to go over the case? Like, no, we're going to go over the people. <laughs> so, Mr. Smith went to this school. This is what's important to him. Great. You know, Mrs. Jones, great, tell me about. So the first thing he did on every case study is tell me about the people. Doesn't care about the organization. I don't care what the mission is. I want to know what the people are. So flipping back to mentorship, we're all different. So when someone comes to me and asks me a question, like I, I got to know who they are because there's, the answer is different depending on who's talking to you, what they want, what their skills are, what their challenges are. And you got to talk to them. And part of it is figuring out well, what do they want to do. If there's some advice I can give them to help them be better at that or make decisions, that's what I see as mentorship. You know, telling them how to be them or tell them what they should be isn't really the job. Helping them focus who they are into what they want to accomplish, I think, is what mm -hmm. the mentorship is. I love that. I think that's a great like icebreaker thing to think yeah. about. I mean, I'm, I'm starting to go through the Dale Carney, you know, uh, how was it? How to make friends and influence people. Yeah. And, and also the other one I'm reading is like 92 tips to talk to anyone, right? And yeah. like, Philip, do you really need that? But honestly, I think that's one of those things, right? Is that yeah. you build rapport. I love that. You build rapport and mentorship relationships by knowing who they are first. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, I think that's a great thing. And I, you know, thinking about like, who are they beyond titles? So like, you already knew, you know, where I grew up. You knew where M grew up. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think... Because that's who that's, you are. I that's, mean, that's a yeah, great, that's a great mean, thing to think about. You can't take a person out of their background just because they started a job. I'm going to start using that. I think that's a yeah. great advice, not just for mentors, but yeah. I think that's in general for working with people. And, 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 like then, you the, said, and it's then the really, advice is genuine as well, because yeah. if you know them, when they come to talk to you, right, you're helping them. I think a lot of times at companies, people bounce around, and if you don't know the people you're working with and you're handing out advice, you're like, is that advice to help you or help someone else? Or is that advice to help me? And I think you don't get that trust. So like, yeah, that. spending time to get to know somebody so that when, when something, you know, bad things happen at work or there's an opportunity for a good thing, like who are you going to reach out to? Like if you know somebody and they're really a good fit or something unfortunate happened and you can help them, you know, knowing who they are is got to be the starting point for absolutely everything. So in the inverse, that's that's how people have gravitated to you as a mentor, right? You get to know people. Mm -hmm. What are some things like you you mentioned a lot of people that you view as mentors? Mm -hmm. um, what are some good tips as someone that is a mentee f to look up to someone? Like so, for instance, I'm thinking like you took a tip by just watching your boss not talk in class. Yeah, that was a that was a good tip for a mentee. Observe what they do. Right. But what are some other tips that you think a mentee should do? Particularly, I think in this case as related to like you and your PhD journey, yeah. what was some good things to like vet is this person, you know, someone I want to look up to or connect with? Oh, true. Cause if you're looking for a mentor, um, mm -hmm. so first of all, you know, do they take the time to listen to who mm -hmm. you are? Mm -hmm. Um, because if they're going to, if they're willing to give that time, they're willing to give time again in the future. Um, and they're going to give you advice for you. Um, okay. and then find people who are also, who are different. Um, you know, you, you're good at networking, getting to know people. So I, especially if you not worry about that, but, um, you know, me, you mentioned the beginning of the podcast, I, I was the outsider. I came in from public health also with the, with the technology background. So we are different, even though we had some commonality, both with that mm -hmm. interest in the class we're in. Um, so having a mentor who's a little bit different, you can bring advice mm -hmm. from those areas to you as well. So I think that's probably, if it's the next question, why it's good to have more than just one mentor. <laughs> yeah, I mean, actually, yeah. that's good. And you obviously spoke to it because I think, I, you know, like I said, not a shameless plug. Yeah. But I did, you know, wrote an article with my mentor, uh, Samara. Yeah. And we did talk about mentorship across identities and how 
there's plus, you know, plus and minuses. There are differences, and you need to have both, right? Yeah. Multiple mentors, mentors yeah. that share identities, yeah. but also you need, like you just said, you need to have mentors that are different than you. Yeah. And I and I, I've definitely have seen the benefit of both, right? Yeah. One that can guide me through the similar life experiences, mm-hmm. but also one that can give me perspectives yeah. on life experiences that I didn't think about because they're different. So yeah, yeah, like yeah, go into that question. You kind of ask your own yeah, question. So, so What's the importance of having more than one? Um. And then talk about how you yeah. Did so that for coming you. out of the IT technology background, I ended up working with a lot of salespeople, who were like, I mean, I'm relatively extroverted for an IT for someone who started <laughs> in IT, but when you start working with salespeople, they are relationship. They just get to know people for a living, but they lack um, the technology or other background. You know, they'll find out a customer needs something or here's the situation. They don't promise that they're going to offer a solution, but then they're also good at coming back and meeting with the various other consultants and experts. Mm -hmm. So those are the connector types, those are the relationship Mm -hmm. types. So for me, working with those people were fascinating. And, you know, I think some of the folks in in engineering and technology can kind of eye roll and look at them like, well, what, what value do they bring? And the more I worked with them, the more I realized you know, it's huge, you know, that's a skill set on its own. They don't teach it in college. Mm-hmm. So getting to know some of those people and asking them, like, how do you get to know these people? How do you network? So for me, that was an area where it was a huge growth area for me that I'm still not as good at it as them. But, you know, learning to respect that group, the extrovert networking was was helpful to me. And then, you know, the next thing you know, you turn around and there might be some introverted engineer who's, you know, brilliant. Mm-hmm. Um, so sometimes you need, I'd always, most of the times I had success, I'd have a small group of very different people and you just come together and you talk through and you guide the conversation. And as a group, you learn so much from them and you create really interesting solutions and ideas um, just out of these temporary groups. So trying to figure out who was willing to work with others, who was willing to um, converse with others and, and that quiet part and listening um, and respect different people's skills um, and put their put their expertise into an overall bigger picture. So it wasn't even like a mentor from a you know senior junior. You know it was mentor across skill set horizontally that I think was a huge part of my career and my success. Now, one thing I think you just spoke about it is bringing groups together. So yeah. you know, obviously we got our little group chat or group me, but you yeah. particularly. Uh, starting a group at Mason, um, and so you, you kind of I want to tell into the importance of cre- creating spaces or making groups. So, yeah. can you talk about that group that you're bringing together, and why was that something that you felt was important? Yeah, so we started a um, Doctor of Public Health um, Graduate Student Association. Being the first cohort, um, we have no traditions, we have no network. People on campus didn't know us and didn't know we existed. And, you know, watching some individuals um, try to collaborate and network. Um, like, for example, um, Julia Mandeville does a lot of work on endometriosis, and she's a force. She already had a network. She knows how to collaborate. She knows how to work social media. But, you know, a lot of, a lot of the other students, we had areas of interest. But, you know, you're working with your faculty advisor, which is amazing, but that's academia, Um, some of the folks are interested in doing a lot of more community work, um, with, with nurses, with uh, substance use disorder. Like, so if you go out an individual and try to talk to the community, try to talk to the county, try to talk to the city, it's harder. So our goal was to pull a student group together so that we can say, Hey, we are a group. And when you got a group of, you know, 15 PhD students, that's a powerful voice. So we started doing things like we went and volunteered down in Arlington County and put together some, uh, uh, some, some bags of, uh, uh, medications and things like that. And it was a nice bonding group, but it also got our word out through the Arlington County, um, public health department. We got known through the George Mason Arlington campus rep. So that's important. You know, our goal going forward is to try to bring in some speakers from a career perspective, Mm -hmm. um, advice on publishing journals, um, and we're working with the faculty because they've got seminars that they can do, but there's things as students where we can choose our own. And everyone's interested in, in you know, what's next for them as a career. I mean, that's typically, mm-hmm. you know, they want to go work for the government, or they want to go work for a nonprofit, or maybe in academia. You know, we can pull together who we want to bring in um, 
and then established the traditions. You know, uh, uh, a bunch of the students just took their qualifying exams, which is stressful. So a couple of the senior students, we went and just said, hey, we're going to be a block down the street at a restaurant. Just come sit with us, right? You know, you've got to start being that support for each other and, you know, sharing your networks. Um, so my hope is that group will start to be the center of a lot of traditions and allow power that, you know, when this next cohort comes in, it's just there, right? They didn't know that there mm -hmm. were no traditions. They just start joining the group and they can participate and bring their energy, set up their events. Yeah, I think that, that you know, that like I, I knew uh, from day one that, you know, it's always we, not me. And yeah. like, you know, from day so one, true. you yeah. saw it. Like from day one, I was like, wow, these people are smart. Yeah. Put your name on this paper. I'm going to start yeah. a group me, right? Yeah. Like it was always, I think the extrovert of yeah. me was like, you know, I don't know anything. I mean, but was you it, come, it, was but it, you're coming it, from communications. I mean, I think there I are know, a lot of experts no back, there. But I had no background in communication. You know, I got a master's, like like you, I got a master's in counseling. Oh, did you? Okay. Uh, yeah, I got, yeah. A, I got a history degree yeah. in undergrad. Yeah. And so that was just more so like, I've always grown as I've navigated. This is just me from being a kid in class. Yeah. Was that I always realized that talking to my neighbor, yeah. if I miss something, I'm yeah. like, yo, what did the teacher say? Yeah. <laughs> that was, that <laughs> right, goes exactly. to that part, right? right and then I'd that. always get like knowledge gaps. Yeah. So even from as a root, as a kid, I was always like, if I miss something, ask my neighbor. Right. And then I realized. But that's not a skill everyone has. I mean, I especially in some of the technical skills, you get people who are more people who are introverted and that you tend to not get that and then put that pressure on yourself to try to do everything yourself and, and that can be overwhelming yeah and i didn't realize that um for me like i said connecting people i guess is a skill but for me when you think of things that um come naturally um that i guess that is come natural but for me it was like a what is it um by me doing it not only i guess helps others but it was fulfilling for me right yeah. so like when I create groups, yes, it helps people. Like, oh, you know, everyone's like, thank you, Philip, for corralling yeah. us together. Yeah. But at the other end, the selfish part is like, I needed this. <laughs> like, right. I need y'all yeah. help. Yes. I need y'all help. Y'all right. send me some links. Now I could just throw something like, hey, how y'all navigate this? Yeah. So there's power in that. And, and I guess that's true, right? So one of the things that I want to leave off is what do you think is the future, right? One is when are you finishing your PhD program? Uh. My goal is next spring, next summer at the latest. All right, yeah, I'm, I'm in dissertation keep... proposal mode now, so yeah. All right, so we're gonna keep him on it, listeners. Yeah. We're gonna keep him on it. All right, watch hey, me. Yeah, we're gonna, <laughs> you, you're gonna tag him on LinkedIn and say, "Where are you at in your program?" <laughs> you put it on wax, please. And then two is then um, similar to that. What do you think is uh, the future of public health? This is the big macro I issue yeah. because you're studying the intertwine of communication yeah. and public health. This is not no scholarly thing. This is not like you need to come with articles, but just yeah. your opinion. What is the future of public health? Because, you know, um, I just listened to a podcast recently uh, with your actual dean. Mm -hmm. And she was telling that the reason that they changed the name of College of Health and Sciences health to and public health, to yeah. it would have human services because it's so intertwined. Right. Mm -hmm. Social work contributes to the community's health. Yeah. So like. Their future was that we need to have a holistic approach on health. Mm -hmm. Thus, why we brought all these schools together yeah. because we're going to work together anyway. So, what is your opinion on public health and its importance? Yeah, and you said also they spend a lot of money on it, right? So that there's obviously some investment yeah. there. Yeah, and so I think the I guess it's hard to not start with with the pandemic. I mean, you mm -hmm. start seeing yep. the the pushback. You've got you know the public health folks saying this is the best practice. You know. Lockdown, very controversial. Um, although, you know, it would think it was, in my opinion, it was necessary because if you didn't do that, um, we're all used to being able to go to the doctor. Um, but if the doctors aren't there and everyone's piled up in the parking lot, I think that's what lockdown prevented. You saw some of the states where they basically said, "Hey, we can't treat everybody," um, and and it would have been worse. So we need to. As far as future public health, I think we need to talk about um, justifying what we do, and and it's hard because you're you know right now when you walk out the door, are you going to get exposed to measles, polio, smallpox? No, it's not a risk because you succeeded. So there's this sort of catch twenty two where the better you do, the less urgent your job is, and they pull resources away from it. Mm. Um, and then you know with the population getting older. 
you know, if we, the better job we do in prevention, the less we're going to spend on healthcare. So I think the big challenge is, you know, to continue success and fund things where you don't see the success because your success is, means there's no problem. So, you know, that's why I'm focusing on working with the school of business on marketing and advertising to try to communicate right, how do we get people's attention who aren't taking the disease seriously um, or don't think the preventions are effective because they'll just rely on the medical system to fix them. But, you know, uh, the it's cyclical, yeah, it's cyclical. And, and actually I've, there's an interesting article from, they looked at at London over the centuries and it was absolutely cyclical where you start seeing them ramp up these preventions and improve, um, you know, water and sewage and, um, hygiene and the diseases would start going away. And then and you're then, good. Then you're good. And you start getting relaxed. Down. You know, you stop funding that stuff and the diseases get worse again. So it was a fascinating article. You could just see it, you know, every sense. 20, 30 years. And then, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the plague would cycle through and all these diseases would just cycle through decades after decades. So I think it's, you know, hopefully we're in the point now where, you know, COVID isn't going to be serious for a while, but you know, it's going to come again and trying to, trying to learn how to talk about something that's not a problem to keep it not being a problem. It's, I, it's a hard job. Yeah. I think, I think you talked about two things that, uh, that were striking as interesting as right. One is you had to connect with business yeah. because I think the thing to get people's attention is how does it affect my money? Yeah, right? it so, is. Like, yeah, exactly. so like you could talk about prevention and like, all right, whatever. But then like business is closed. Oh, okay. They got yeah, my attention right. now. The right? economy isn't doing well. Then yeah. That brings up a my bunch pockets. of problems. I'm Absolutely. listening now that it hits my pockets. That's yeah. one. It does. And two, it is, I think uh, they did say the same thing is that most, the, the, the infusion of communication and public health is advertising preventative, right? Like yeah. getting ahead of everything yeah. so that it isn't a problem. Yeah. And that's hard to convince people. It's hard to convince people that doing this when you have no effects, you're healthy, yeah. will keep you healthy, right? right. Yeah. Most people are going to be reactive like, okay, you know, I'll take a, I'll take an ad for like not smoking cigarettes when I got lung cancer. Yeah. Right. Like yeah. it's easy to convince me not to smoke because I got the lung cancer now. Right. But it's hard not to convince me not to smoke when I'm good. Yeah, <laughs> like, you know, exactly. And so that preventative part is really there. Right. Yeah. Or like safe sex things. Right. Like, yeah. you know, you know, you know, put on, you know, put on contraceptives and all this stuff. Yeah. It's easy to talk about that when you got no kids. And then you're like, oh, man, I should have wore a condom. <laughs> like, you yeah. know, like, so all these things are easier to it's easy to convince someone when the negative effects have already happened to yeah, them. It it's is. really out of sight, out of mind. Right. Uh, when you're good, you're invincible. <laughs> like, exactly. You know, like, you know. I think there's some <laughs> of the states that are really pulling back on healthcare or on public health spending. And then honestly, a lot of the public health, local public health folks are resigned and switched careers because the pandemic was brutal on them. Um, emotionally, a lot of them got sick several times because they had to keep working. So I think you're going to see less spending, spending in public health, fewer public health employees, and you know, you'll start seeing sexually transmitted infections increase, hepatitis increase, et cetera. And I think then you'll start seeing it in the news and then they'll mm -hmm. reinvest. So um, you know, it's disappointing, but I think it's, it's partly human nature. But you know, we started you know, the conversation you know, with me being in a communications class. Mm -hmm. I think communications working with public health marketing, advertising, work with public health, you know, how can we convince people to, you know, invest in, in such, because it's what will keep us healthy and keep the costs under control. Got it. Well, this is the part of the show called shot for shot. You get to ask me any random question. I ask you a random one question. You want to go first? I go first. Oh, let's see. I can help you if I go first. Uh, so what, what I'll go first. Okay. What, uh, what class are you most excited to take next? I don't know yet. Cause I haven't registered. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, ideally, hopefully I'm doing this independent study, um, because I want to apply for an anti-racism grant. Okay. And so for me to do the anti-racism grant, I need 4.5 credits. So I need to take a class and a 1.5 independent study. Okay. So for you, for then to answer your question, so you don't feel like I just give you short answers. I'm, I'm excited for the 1.5 independent study. Okay. Yeah. So that I can do this anti-racism grant. Love it. That's yeah. And my anti-racism grant right. is on, as we talked about earlier Good. in my class. That excitement is what keeps you going yeah. and keeps coming back. It was yeah. the um, project about creating inclusive black spaces uh, will help um, people for retention, recruitment, and resilience. Yeah. Excellent. That's my project, okay. hopefully. 
right. All right. So, um, Virginia Tech, you know, Hokie. Yeah. yeah. Uh, did you go to football games? That's my first part. Oh, I went to the campus up here in Northern Virginia. So okay, I was about to say one. Okay. I, I've been down there for a couple of games because one of my sons went there. Okay, what is your favorite uh, sports memory then? Not even just Virginia Tech, but any sport memory. What's your favorite sport memory? Oh, uh, it's got to be Mason uh, Final Four. You were there? Uh, no, uh, but just I had friends who went to North Carolina to all those teams we beat along the way. And like they would all call me like middle of the second half, like, Kevin. Oh my god and i'm just laughing so i mean it was just memory after memory um yeah you remember that I remember all right that. cool and and the the summer before that happened okay. um tony skin and lamar butner the two the two guards and tony mm-hmm. skin now the That's new coach. Bags coach he was the camp counselor for for my sons okay and they loved the camp and they loved the counselors and yeah so i'm so excited that that he's back and so Carrying that sort of, you know, indirect relationship from my my both my son's excitement from the camp, and then seeing the uh, the guards out there playing, and especially to, uh, I don't know if you remember, but Tony got in trouble at the yeah. end of the CAA. Yeah. Um, so watch him uh, sit out the first game because he misbehaved. You know, when you see a young man, look at that and go, oh yeah, he lost his he, he lost his temper briefly, coach. You know, set him aside. You know, he learned from it, and he made a run. So, I mean, as far as a father, you know, watching your sons try to learn sportsmanship and learn to recover and from failure and resilience and go on to success. Um, you know, um, I think that was. I mean, so it wasn't necessarily like a touchdown pass or anything, but as far as a sports experience and moment, that sort of relationship, watching those guards grow up, and then watching my sons watch that process of, um, you know sportsmanship and, and failure and success and resi- resilience, I think, sticks with them. That's awesome. And also yeah. the fact that it was very personal. Like, I, he could say, like, that was my camp counselor. Yeah, you know? yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. That's a really great story. Yeah. So now we're at the part of the show called Shout Outs and Plugs. So obviously you get an opportunity to share love, yeah. show love to anyone you want to show love to. And then plugs, these are things, you know, I put in the show notes as well as, you know, just share the ways that people can follow up with you or things that you're working on that you would like to share with the listeners. So Shout Outs and Plugs. Got it. Yeah, so I've already mentioned um, um, Dr. Rose and Van Fricken, who were, you know, as far as academics, were helpful. And then just my classmates in general um, got a powerful group there. Um, and then my friend Red over in the health informatics program. There's, there's lots of wonderful ladies in the College of Public Health, and there's a ton of them. So I was in a meeting, and, and Red walked in. Uh, he's a, a former Marine and has experience doing IT consulting. So it was nice to have another dude around and I'm doing some collaboration with him on a chatbot paper and my friend, Rachel, um, as far as, uh, next, next steps. Yeah. Trying to get that chatbot paper published. Um, and then trying to get my dissertation proposal approved. So my goal is to get that by the end of the summer. Excellent. Excellent. Well, Kevin has been great having you on your show or on my show on your yeah. show. This is your episode. So on this episode, but um, yeah. thank you so much for joining us. And thank you. As I said earlier, you've been really helpful, not only me to other students in our program and just being a great resource. So thank you. And this, we really, I can speak on other people's behalf and say that we're very appreciative of that. And that's just something that's, you know, your kindness and that has been really helpful. Um, positive filter listeners if you like this episode please share it with a family member or friend as I said every episode is dedicated to the memory of my late father-in-law Jeff Kirsch so please consider donating to the Jeff Kirsch anti-hunger fund it is something I put in the show notes of every episode uh, to honor him Uh, if you like this episode share it with a family member or friend give it a like subscribe or review on Apple or Spotify that helps elevate the podcast and thank you so much for listening Thank you for listening to Positive Filter, a podcast that focuses on family, friends, career, with a little self-help along the way. If you enjoyed this podcast, please share it with your family and friends and like the Facebook page, spreading positivity of movement. Thanks for listening.